each year we try to find a speaker that is interesting that can speak to this crowd because it's, it's, we have so many first responders in here and such. Um, and uh, it was it was brought up by Chief Foster um, to look at tonight's speaker, and I thought he, he had a great, great idea. Um, this gentleman is one of the most humble people that I've ever met. Um, he travels all over the world teaching and uh, helping others. He, uh, he works with the U.S. Marshal's Office. He was uh, one of the first officers on at the Oklahoma City uh, bombing. Um, he's a paramedic. Um, he kind of does everything, and, he, and he's got a cape. He doesn't bring it out very often, but he does have a cape. And the most difficult part of this for me was like, how do I, how do I, how do I possibly introduce this guy? And uh, so I think we, we came up with it, and I'm gonna leave it at this. Um, he's the most interesting guy in the world. So, Bill Justice, come on up. Can I stay down here? Is this okay? Awesome. Oh, this is fantastic. Um, so, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Luckily, they weren't checking the passports too closely, so they let me in from Oklahoma to see you guys. Really, really happy to be here. Um, can we put the presentation up? Go to the next slide. Ah, oh, there you go. A uh, little history there. Uh, this is my son years and years ago. Uh, he had just gotten his paramedic. He was finishing up his clinicals. And he came down here to fly with CareFlight for a while, so very appreciative to you guys for helping Aaron get along with that. Next one. Disclosure, I have none, so next slide. <laughs> one more. There you go. So let's talk about time. Uh, first of all, Brandon said I had a couple hours to get this done. I think I will it down about an hour 45. So it's going to be fine. Is that good? Good, all right. Good deal. Uh, so buckle in, and we'll make this happen. Um, time does fly. It truly does. So the next slide, uh, if anybody is Star Wars kind of people, you'll get that. But the next one is this. So at eight years old, um, growing up in Knoxville, Tennessee, so I'm hillbilly. And um, up until this particular day, my parents were both in the military. Uh, mom's in the Navy, my dad was in the uh, Army. And from being a little age that I can remember, I was going to be a soldier. I was going to be a soldier. Every toy that I asked for for birthdays and Christmas, always military based. I had so many army men, I could be the commander of my own division. So this particular day, though, changed all that. I'm, I'm sleigh riding, and the fire truck, so the next slide, goes down the street. Back then, everybody rode the tailboard. So these guys are getting dressed on the back, and one of the firefighters, as he's trying to get his jacket on and still hang on to the bar, uh, his helmet came off, went bouncing down the road. The fire engine couldn't stop. They've got to get to their emergency call. So uh, I had a pretty fast sled. So I got to the helmet and I put it on and I wore it the rest of the day. Uh, I, I never, I never saw the engine come back. It wasn't like I hid from them or anything like that. But I never saw them. So then, fast forward, it got dark. I go home, still wearing the helmet, by the way. And I walk into the house. And my mother said, "Where'd you get that?" And I said, uh, it "Came off the fire truck. They didn't want it. True story." And uh, since there are kids in the audience. Uh, I'm going to reword this and say, at that point, I got a butt whooping. Uh, then, mom loaded me in the car, we drove up to the firehouse uh, to return the fire helmet. What was interesting then is that several of the guys that were at the station had gone to school with my mother, so it's kind of like an old reunion for them, so they're talking. And then, the fire station's located right across from my elementary school at the time. So what happened there in those relationships were that I could stop by the station after school on the weekends. I would go to the station. Um, matter of fact, it wasn't too many months later that they actually gave me a, my own blue shirt that I would wear while I was there. And then looking back at it though, like when I was shining the bell, mopping the floors, stuff like that, that was like free child labor. You guys get that, right? So I was like, well, okay. But, but that truly, this changed my life as far as knowing what I wanted to do in the future. That was going to be my career. Completely changed. I was very focused with that particular day. I will say this too. So for a lot of us, uh, you may not know this, back then, they had to buy their own bunker gear. Buy their own bunker gear. Most firefighters back then could not afford the pants. In Oklahoma, I'm sorry, in Tennessee, they call them quick hitches. Again, hillbillies. Uh, we call them bunker gear. That, 
they have three quarter boots, coat, helmet, and they had to buy themselves. That's, that's pretty impressive. So we, we were glad we returned that. Everybody with me so far? All right, so that started the foundation of the rest of this story. And so thanks for putting up with it. So next one is in the, my, my parents still in the military, we moved around a lot. So we went to New Jersey for a while, that was a trip. They, uh, I said Beal uh, as my name, as I would introduce myself. They thought I said Beetle as in Bud. So I had to put up with that for a year. And then we moved to Paducah, Kentucky. And again, still in my mind, I'm wanting to figure out how I can become a firefighter, how, how quick it's gonna take me. And obviously there's an age situation involved, but man, that's what I'm looking at. And then again, back then, things certainly seemed a little bit easier uh, hence that upper left image that you see. Next one. One more. Oh, here we go. All right. So on this one, I want you to just to look at that picture. Those bell bottoms, that's 100% sexy right there. 100%. <laughs> so uh, we moved to Paducah, Kentucky. The uh, ambulance service was private. The fire department didn't want anything to do with the EMS. So that was causing me an issue there. And matter of fact, even the chief at the time said, we're not gonna do EMS, uh, we're not gonna do that, that's the ambulance services job. So uh, my first job out of high school, uh, I went to work for these guys and uh, started kind of getting, I guess, my experience down. Still looking though, still looking for a fire department that was gonna go ALS and that embraced EMS and then also special operations, things like Pineapple rescue and dive rescue and those kind of things. So this next picture that you're going to see, uh, I'm just going to stop that one story and then go to this other story. Anybody in your 20s in here? Anybody 20 years old? Anybody act 20 in here? Okay, so so if you're 20, okay, so this, this story is kind of about you. In our 20s, we're kind of our, our armor is on. We don't think anything could possibly hurt us. Correct? I mean, everybody remember that in your 20s? And uh, this particular day in Paducah, Kentucky. This girl had had an argument with her significant other, and she's in her teens, by the way, and so she climbed under the I-24 bridge, it's the bridge that connects uh, Kentucky to Illinois. She climbs under the bridge, you see her there, she's right at about 108 feet, uh, is what I was told by the officials. Anyway, so I climbed down to, and I'm trying to talk her out of committing suicide. So we're having this conversation. I'm not a negotiator at this point either. I'm still not. And so we're talking, and at the end, she said, you know what, I really don't want to die. I said, great idea. And so you see her, as the photographer caught her, she's trying to move and get up. She's not wanting to fall. But she slips and falls into the water, 108 feet, 108 feet. So again, being in my 20s, what could go wrong, correct? So I jump off after her, 108 feet down. <laughs> now I have literally had, Scott Lales one of them, he'll go, hey, you're, that was awesome, awesome, you're a hero, you're extremely brave. And, and I think about that and go, have you lost your mind? That was a long way down, and there are a lot of things that you can think of on your way down. First of all, I thought, man, that was a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> second, this is gonna hurt, uh, when I, and it did. And so it worked out, the next slide is it did work out. We did get her out, she's fine, and hopefully she's living a, a very blessed life as well. But just that sidebar from this one is that when, when you are in your 20s, uh, we still follow this. We, we risk a lot for, to save a lot, but we risk a little to save a little. You have to take care of yourself in your young years of your career to make it to the end. Next one. All right. So later then, while I'm in Paducah, there was a uh, news article that came out that Hobbs, New Mexico, was hiring firefighters because they wanted to... Uh, progress their EMS system and they were going to go care about it. I thought, man, that's awesome. So another person that I worked with in Paducah and I go out to the Hobbs, New Mexico and uh, we get on the job. I got to tell you, the first day in the academy, as I'm sitting there, the training chief, his nickname was Redbird. He's a big husky guy with flaming red hair. And he comes in, he's talking about airway management. And he said, okay, so when we use a canula, which is actually pronounced cannula, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh my Lord, I've made a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, but fast forward, things, things went really well. They're still very active, and they're doing a great job in Hobbs, New Mexico. This next slide, though, was, was kind of funny. The officer there that you see in the white shirt, he was toward the end of his career. He was getting ready to retire. We had such a fun shift 
And you can see the guy on the right, he's quite a com comic anyway. But we had such a fun shift that he delayed his retirement because he was having so much fun at the bar station. So we got a kick out of that. I want to just pause for a second too and say, as I'm sharing my stories with you, I'm not bragging, that's for sure, because uh, I hate to talk about myself. But the other is, is this, is taking challenges, things that challenge you, and turn those into opportunities. Opportunities that you can use, maybe now, but also maybe later. And it'll make sense as we get to the end of this. All right, next slide. So now fast forward, um, I had taken a trip from, from Hobbs to Oklahoma City with some friends, and while I was there, I noticed that Oklahoma City Fire was hiring. And uh, they had thousands of applicants for 30 jobs. Thousands of applicants for 30 jobs. Pretty incredible. So I applied. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Ooh, there's a big challenge. Now I was like, oh, what do I do now? So I went to work for the ambulance service there. It was called AmCare. It's called IMSA now. Uh, still in operation. And so the second test comes around next year, the following year. Same thing, thousands of people that applied 30 positions. I didn't get that one either. Then, third time, third time's charm apparently, um, I applied. This time, thousands of applicants, and he took 62 62. I'm not sure what number I was. I was just happy to get in, right? So 93-1 was my academy. Um, we had a great academy. After the academy, I was assigned to squad 17, and the best job ever. I mean, ever. And I can tell you at this point, uh, at least in my mind, I have reached the goal that I had set for myself. It's exactly what I wanted to do. My son's an Oklahoma City firefighter now, and he laughs because when they look back, we don't do squats anymore. But the squad work was you got to make everything good, everything big, right? And you didn't have to pick up hose. So we got to leave early. So he still gives me a hard time about that. But it was, it was funny that. Um, it just worked out this way. Now, when I got on, this is 93. Remember, so let's fast forward to 95. Next slide. So the Oklahoma City bombing uh, occurred, and it that was a pretty horrific event. We, we learned a lot of stuff from that. We had some great responses. We made mistakes, just like anybody else would. But at that point, in 1995, something else changed. And that was National Tactical Association, National Tactical Officers Association, if I can that uh, made it mandated that all tactical teams, special operations teams, have a negotiator and have a paramedic. How about that? So I'm at the fire station one day, knock on the door. Some of our law enforcement guys came in from uh, Oklahoma City Police. They sat down and told us about this. Hey, we have to add medics to our attack team. Would you guys be interested? And we said, oh, we have none. Nobody likes you guys. Uh, they like us. And it, truly, this is the way it went. Now, we knew each other, too, so we're kind of kind of playing around. But at the same time, I had no interest. I mean, like, zero interest in being a cop. And I wasn't sure. They weren't really sure what to do with the medics, either. Matter of fact, my first practice day, as I showed up early, by the way, I was ready to go. And I had this bag about this tall. I'm not making that up, because I want to make sure I had everything in there. Way too big, by the way. Um, I showed up, and they said, hey, if you'll just have a seat on the bleachers over there, and we'll call you if we need you. And that's the way the whole day went. So they were like, I just sat there. I'm like, okay. So after we kind of got our rhythm with that, things started changing. So they would do things like this. They would call at nighttime to ask questions about their sick kids. What do you think about that? Trust, right? I mean, it's like, wow, you got to at least have some faith in the person you're calling to treat your kid. So that was kind of interesting. And then, we started really getting involved. We would be the medical conscience for the team leaders. Like if the bandit or the target was acting funny, correct? Uh, was it low sugar? Was it whatever else? And it was helpful. We were more a part of that operation at that point, and it worked extremely well. At the end of 95, um, again, we're doing local stuff. The U.S. Marshals came in, Western Division is where I'm assigned now still, uh, in Oklahoma City, and they said, we, we want you guys that are on this team to be on our team, too. And it's like, wow, cool. So we're going to federal. They said, yeah, so awesome. And think about this, a firefighter with an automatic weapon may not be safe, may not be safe, but that's the way it worked out. So that's in 95, 1995. Just throwing those dates out there again. It'll all make sense here in just a few minutes. All right, next slide. All right, 
So here we are, we go through, go through tactical school, and the picture on the bottom there, we're in Florida, and the sign that was on that thing around my neck said, safe bomb. I mean, what could go wrong with that too, correct? So we had to get a picture. The guy to the left, just really quick, his name's uh, Dennis Healy, recently retired, New York City ESU. That guy is incredible, and he still teaches today. The guy on the right is one of our tactical physicians still today, Jim Davis. So the next slide, then, is this one, and it's Mark Crawford on the left with U.S. Marshal Service. He recently retired. He was my handler when I first started at the Marshals. A great guy, very good mentor, very good mentor. And uh, myself, Kim Floyd in the middle. And then what, what I always get a kick out of, Roy Smith, young, very far right. He's a big boy, right? I mean, a big boy. It's funny to me that the U.S. government cannot find a helmet to fit that boy's head. It's always, just always kind of a joke for us. All right, once again, what year are we in? 95, very good, okay, next slide. All right, so sometimes things just change. You may know that that change is coming or you may not have any idea whatsoever. I, I did not on this. I had a friend who had left the Marshal Service and gone to the private sector. The private sector was an energy company and they're all over the world, China, Russia, Brazil, uh, Mexico, or I'm sorry, Texas, and Mexico as well. And so they're all over. And he said, hey, we need this international medical person that can come in and kind of oversee our medical training. Also, to make sure that our crews are safe. Some of them were working in jungles or offshore and things like that. I said, man, I, I never thought about that. That sounds pretty cool. I got to tell you, the paycheck was nice, like really nice. Not anything that I ever experienced on the public uh, safety center. So this went on for a couple of years. And then, without any warning at all, Next slide. They started just firing me. I mean, layoff, massive layoffs. Hundreds of people. And I can remember being in Houston, Texas. I'm up in a high rise and looking down, and there are, there are two levels or two widths of taxis around the building that I was in. And how they were doing that was they call you to HR, and you show up at HR, and they go, here's your paint slip. See, you never got to go back to your office. You didn't get to go to yours or you get to go to yours. They were going to box your stuff up and then send it to you like, like holy, I've never experienced anything like that. Because again, my, my entire life has been public safety. So now I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So the next slide is this, is I fell back to the training that I took those opportunities to do early on. Once again, wasn't interested in tactical medicine being anything uh, like connected with law enforcement at all, but, but I did it and it was offered and I'm glad I did because I fell right back into that. This is currently my job position. I'm assigned to four different divisions and uh, they kind of support one another so that makes it work. But once again, if I hadn't looked at those challenges and made those opportunities and took those opportunities, I would have missed out. So I'm just throwing this out there to you that when those opportunities arise for you, Maybe not making such a quick decision like I did, but being open-minded enough to see what that might do for you in the future and how you can use that. Next slide. All right, so putting the pieces together, and, and this is it. We'll, right after this, we'll take a 30-minute inter intermission, and then I'll finish on that last one. Um, the, have, a, have a good one. Truly have a mentor. Have a good one. Have a good one. Um, the other is be a mentor. And being one does, does a couple things, but the main one for you is it gives you self-satisfaction, it gives you direction, and it makes you know whatever the material is that you're presenting or that you're mentoring with. It just makes you a better person. So have a mentor, but be a mentor for somebody too. Stay open-minded, turn those challenges into opportunities, because again, they're gonna be priceless for you at the end of the day. That gratitude, I think, uh, needs to be there, and we need to cultivate that more. It's, we, we see sometimes where you've done a great job, and people just forget to say thank you. So I'll say it for them. Thank you. Next, and the last one is embrace your journey. It goes fast. It goes fast. I was talking to several folks tonight, even, that have been in the business for a long, long time, and they agree in a blink of an eye, it seems like it's over. So enjoy it while you're doing it. That's it. Thank you so much. Appreciate you having me.